Okay, dear friends, it is in uh, with great humility uh, that I would like to say some words in the memory of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of Great Britain, a great illuminary, great scholar, and a great representative of the Jewish people. And um, the topic I would like to call this is uh, the meaning of rabbinic leadership, or what is a rabbi. But I want to start with a story. And um, <clears throat> and each, I want to tell just a few stories, but maybe, <clears throat> um, story number one is um, a story which uh, I saw actually on one of the many wonderful videos and interviews of Rabbi Sachs, which is one of the uh, amazing tributes. And therefore, I don't want to talk too much about his thought because there's really the possibility yourselves to go into YouTube to watch many, many videos of his. And I, I don't want to deny you that, um, that pleasure and the enriching experience that it is. And of course, the 30 books that he published. So I just want to say a few things in regards to rabbinic leadership. So the story goes that Rabbi Sachs tells the story of <clears throat> when he was a uh, chief rabbi, of course, Tony Blair was one of the prime ministers of Great Britain. And uh, Blair was a religious man. In England, it's not um, so customary for politicians to talk about the religious aspects of their lives, they are assumed to be secularists, whether it's true or not. So these are private matters. And he said, one day uh, Blair said to him, uh, would you be interested in maybe uh, reading the Bible together? And Rabbi Sachs said, of course, it would be an honor, it'd be a privilege. So uh, that's what they did. For a while they were meeting once a week and reading the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and um, Rabbi Sachs tells the story that they got to uh, the book of Vaikra, of Leviticus, and they were getting towards the end of the book, excuse me, in Shmot, the book of Shmot, towards the end of the book, I'm sorry, Exodus. And then Tony turned to him and said, Mr. Blair turned to him and said, okay, now we're coming to that boring part. Rabbi Sachs said, what are you referring to? He said, you know, where it starts talking about building the tabernacle and how they built the tabernacle. I mean, it really does go on and on. So Rabbi Sachs said, well, let me put it this way. In Genesis, it, God creates the universe in Genesis chapter one in 22 verses. But in Exodus, in describing the tabernacle, the Mishkan, it takes four and a half portions of the Torah, <laughs> which is many, many verses, hundreds of verses, to describe the building of this sanctuary for God. So obviously it is easier for the infinite God to build a finite world for human beings than for finite, than for finite human beings to build a sanctuary for the infinite God. So Rabbi Sachs says that Blair liked that uh, interpretation, but he said the truth is that after it bothered him. <laughs> because even though it was a nice way of expressing it, he started wondering, what does it really mean? And why does the book of Shmot spend these four and a half chapter, four and a half parshiot, four and a half portions, pericops, on the building of the Mishkan? First the command to build the tabernacle, and then the carrying out of the command. What is it all about? And as he pondered this issue, he thought, well, look, we have the 12 tribes of the Jewish people came out of Egypt. And we have 12 tribes, you have also have different points of, of view and different social groups. How do you get all these tribes together? How do you get them to act together, to be together? We know what happened later on in the book of Judges, fighting between the tribes. So how do you get these tribes unified? So he says, 
the only way to get them unified was to do something unified together. Building the Mishka and building the tabernacle, having a common goal, was a way to get all these tribes together. He said, based on that, he wrote another book <laughs> about how to unify people in a, in a collective society, despite the fact that they have diversity of background and culture. And he also presented it uh, to Mr. Blair as an idea for England, etc. This was one aspect of the many aspects of Rabbi Sachs's thinking. This real belief in the fact that human beings can solve problems. That problems are challengeable, are challenges. They're not insurmountable. And if problems exist, because that's what life is full of, it's because we have to solve them. And if we can teach human beings to work together, there's something about the inner nature of the human being that can overcome what sometimes seems like insurmountable problems. So this is an idea that he found in the book of Exodus about how to overcome problems in society, get people to work on a common cause. Another time, I want to quote another um, one of the uh, one of the lectures of Rabbi um, Sachs. He was um, this was I think in 2017. It was in Toronto, where he was invited by the Torah in Motion organization to give a talk at the Sharei Shalom Synagogue. And in the talk, he talked about anti-Semitism. He said, far from me to be judgmental or to judge people, but he says, I think in retrospect, Jews of the 19th century in Europe made a big mistake. Of course, it was an understandable mistake, but it was a big mistake. He said, and what was the big mistake? He says, the mistake was that after the emancipation of the early 1800s, when Jews received rights vis-a-vis -vis the nations that they were living among, they started um, <clears throat> realizing they wanted to integrate into the non-Jewish societies, now that they were not bound to their Jewish communities. But when they looked around right and left, they saw that people didn't like Jews. And they figured, well, if they don't like us, then obviously it's because we look different, we act different. Maybe they don't like that we're not speaking their language well enough, we'll do that. Maybe they don't like that we pray in Hebrew, we'll pray in English or French or German, whatever they're doing. And we'll start being like them. We'll change our synagogues, we'll change our customs. They don't like that we eat only by ourselves, we'll eat with them. And you just thought, if they're going to like us, if we become like them, the more we become like them, the more we look like them, the more we act like them, the more they'll accept us. He said the result of the 19th century Jewish attempt to assimilate into European culture just created racial anti-Semitism in the second half of the 19th century. Once Jews stopped defining themselves religiously, so anti-Semitism had to have a new interpretation. It was now racial anti-Semitism. It was the race of the Jews. What does it matter if they keep the Sabbath, keep the kosher? Their blood is different. Their DNA is different. The rise of racial anti-Semitism, therefore, countered the attempt of Jews in Europe to try to be like everybody else. Rabbi Sachs, looking back at this, says, this was a big mistake. You see, the victim of anti-Semitism cannot solve anti-Semitism. It is only the perpetrators who can solve anti-Semitism. But Rabbi Sachs also believed that it was possible. He said, we need allies. We need to discuss. We need to talk, because there are a lot of good people out there. And many of them also influential and thinkers. And these allies 
can help the world overcome anti-Semitism, but we cannot do it. Definitely not alone. And, but he was a big believer in this interface with other peoples and other cultures and explaining exactly who we are and what we do to the outside world. In a third talk, in a TED talk that he gave in uh, Vancouver, Canada, he talked about something which today has become even more disturbing, but already in his time, he was talking, I mean, when he was giving this talk in 2017, he started talking about cancel culture. Cancel culture, that you don't want to hear opinions that are different than yours. He says the internet, unfortunately, has exacerbated the problem. Because, as we all know, if you look for something on YouTube or Facebook, and they see that you like one thing, they'll only show you that one thing. If you like certain news stations, you'll see news stations that have the same agenda of that news station. And all the other opinions, they'll just siphon out for you. It's, it's not a problem. You won't, be, you won't uh, have any problem in the sense that you won't have to hear any points of view, which are points of view that you don't agree with. He says, the problem with the cancel culture is that's not heavy, healthy, aside from the fact that it's trying to cancel people out. But that's not how human beings grow. And he tells a very personal story. He says when he was in college in his early 20s, studying at Cambridge University, having a wonderful time in the world of philosophy and thinking and ideas and diverse ideas, and living in his own little bubble, <laughs> slightly antisocial. He says that was when all of a sudden, he met his wife-to-be, who was totally different than him, very social, very bubbly, very smiling. And then he knew that he needed somebody in his life who would be different than him in order to challenge him and make him into a better person. And he says, in general, other ideas help us grow. It's dealing with ideas that we don't agree with, that we have to struggle and think about our ideas in order to understand them better says that's what a, a true thinker is. Not somebody who runs away from the challenge, but sees the other approach as a challenge and thinks about it. You can either agree or disagree, but thinking about it helps you grow and helps you mature. Um, and one last thing. Um, in a very moving tribute that I was reading on the internet by, um, uh, Dr. Miriam, Miriam uh, Feldman K. So she uh, remind, reminded me of the um, Rabbi um, Sachs's interpretation of a Midrash. There's a Midrash in Midrash Rabbah, Parsha Lech Lecha, Genesis, that says that um, Abraham finding God can be compared to a man who is walking on his way and sees Bira Doleket, which is usually translated as a lit up palace. He says a palace which is lit up. And then he wonders if this palace is full of lights, can it be that there is no owner of the palace? No Balabite? And finally the owner popped out his head from the window and said, I am the owner of the palace. In the same way, Abraham was looking for God until God revealed himself to Abraham and so he said, Lech lecha me'artzecha, go from your land to the land I will show you. This is the way it's usually interpreted. Rabbi Sachs says, sees it as different. Rabbi Sachs says, Bira doleket doesn't mean a lit up house. It means a palace on fire that's burning down. Doleket, for the word lika says, Abraham saw a world that was becoming corrupt, that was falling apart, and this created inner anguish. And he said, it cannot be that there is a world that is coming apart. There must be another way. 
there must be some leader of this world who can help the world come to a better way. For Rabbi Sachs, faith was never an answer, it was always the question. It was always a quest. And men of faith, like women of faith, are people who are troubled with the problems of society, with the problems of the world. Abraham Joshua Heschel used to see the idea of the ideal Jew as the prophets, the ones who are troubled with the fact that there is evil in the world. You might say for Rabbi Sachs, the man of faith is the one who is troubled with evil, evil in the world. And it creates a certain empathy and a, a certain desire for change and to find other allies in the world of people who are interested in making the world a better place. Having said these things, first of all, I want to encourage you to watch as many of his videos <laughs> as you can get your hand on, obviously not in the same day, but they're very, very inspiring, very balanced, and very inter interesting in the interface that he constantly gives us between world culture and Jewish culture, which enriches the dialogue. Because Rabbi Sachs was in constant dialogue with world culture, which is something very beautiful about every presentation he has of Judaism. The last thing I want to talk about then is what exactly <clears throat> is a rabbi? And uh, I'm going to describe it inspired by Rabbi Sachs. You know, the Talmud says that the degree, of course, for rabbi is called yore yore, to teach to teach, based on the verse in Isaiah, umi yore de'a, umi avin shmua, who is it who can teach knowledge and who is it who understands um, uh, wisdom, shmua wisdom that you hear. So the uh, the Talmud actually tells a story about yore, about teaching, and it talks about halakha, about teaching Jewish law correctly, about a certain man who um, came to this town on Passover and saw them eating um, flour that was made into bread from swamp water, which is definitely unleavened bread, chametz. I said to him, why are you doing this? I said, what do you mean? There was a rabbi who came here one time and explained to us that even though you can't mix flour and water on Passover for bread, but if it's swamp water, it's okay. He said, swamp water is okay, why? So he tried to find out who the guy was. Who was this rabbi who said the swamp water was okay? Turns out the guy said, may seem egg yolk, <laughs> not water. But he said his Hebrew was such that it sounded like may saim, which means a swamp. So they mistook him. And they, when he said you can have flour with eggs, they thought it was swamp water. In other words, first of all, a teacher has to be very clear of what they are saying, meaning it has to be clear for themselves first in order for it to be clear to others. But the second thing, if we're in that actually verse in Isaiah, it says, Mia vin shmua. Not only do you have to know how to teach, you have to have the understanding of the inner meaning behind the teaching. It's not enough to teach halakha. You have to have a feeling of the, the Weltanschauung of Judaism, of where it's all coming from. When you understand where it's all coming from, the halakha is much more clear. And in Israel, we always used to say, when I grew up, that there are two types of rabbis. There's the Rosh Hashiva, the head of the Yeshiva, of the academies, and then there's a Posei Kalacha, the one who decides Halacha. There are two different thinkers. The head of the Yeshiva likes discussing uh, the inner, um, uh, let's say, the inner life of the legal disputes, and the Posei just wants to know what the action is, and so it's a different way of thinking, a different way of looking at law. But the truth is, there's a third type of rabbi. And we know, if all for the, those of us who came from abroad, we know very well community leaders, heads of synagogues, heads of communities, the ones who have to represent the Jewish people and represent Judaism both to the community and to the world. These are very important spokespeople. 
because the message of Judaism is a message which is needed today. Not only for Jews, but it's definitely needed for Jews, because there are many Jews who did not have the chance of either learning Judaism or learning Judaism from the right source. And you even have people went through religious educations and were turned off. Because not everyone knows how to represent Judaism. Not everybody has the ability and the skill. The Talmud says on the verse, David says, who is it who shall speak the uh, stre- the uh, shall speak the uh, the strength of the Lord, Gvuro Tashem, only one who knows how to tell all his glory. If you don't know how to tell all of God's glory, it's better to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and this is one of the problems. So I made a list, um, which I think is uh, what exactly a community leader type rabbi is about. And I made this list by meeting people like this. <laughs> and Rabbi Sachs was definitely one of them. By the way, I met Rabbi Sachs many, many years ago. I was in my 20s. At that time, I was running an organization, a religious students organization in Israel, where we were working with students who came from abroad to Israel one year, and then they were going back to their communities. And Rabbi Sachs, that was right before he was chief rabbi, and he used to come to Israel to visit family and he gladly a few times came to speak at these weekend retreats that we had for these students because he felt it was important and he was a great inspiration for them. And um, lots of things happened in that regard. So I'd like to talk about what I call 10 um, characteristics of um, of what a rabbi should be in order to lead a community. Number one, not afraid of community leaders, <laughs> right? Rabbis are supposed to have independent thinking and be autonomous in their thought and not to be worried about what this guy's gonna think and what that's gonna think because then you can never say anything of importance. I've always said, if nobody ever differed with you, or if nobody ever criticized with you, criticize you, then you probably never said anything important in your life. Because sometimes new ideas, there are always people who are going to find them unusual, even if they're totally authentic. So that's number one, not to be afraid of community la- leaders and what they're going to think, but to be true and honest to your personal belief. Number two, not to fear what the establishment will say. Are the rabbis, right? It's not a question of the establishment. If this is the way you understand Judaism, this is the way you understand the st- sources, there can be a lot of people who agree with you. I found this many times. Number three, a real rabbi is self-propelled in their thinking. First, they study the sources, like it says in the Talmud, has v'acharkach katet, First be silent and then try to think about what these things mean. But they're self-propelled in their thinking, which means they are like wellsprings. They come up with new ideas all the time. And this thinking is the power and the energy that pushes them forward. Number four, they have a way of explaining things that wins over even their adversaries. It's not that there are no people who disagree with them, but they have a way of explaining things that people who thought they were adversaries, when they listen to the logic and the reason of their argumentation, they find themselves agreeing with them, at least on most things. Number five, they display a love of all mankind and of the people of Israel. Because when you have a love of the Torah, and when you have a love of God, you have a love of God's children. Now, the poor ones of your community come first. So as leaders of the Jewish people, of course, we're 
want to help the Jewish people first and foremost. But since all of mankind is God's children, there's also an affinity and a love for all of mankind. Number six, to see both the individual and the collective. Because in the end of the day, we're all individuals. And therefore, real rabbinic leadership not only talks to the collective, but also to the individual. It's easy to preach to the collective, the person you don't see, who doesn't react. You can't see their happiness or their sadness. You can just talk to the air and see everybody of a collective. But when you realize they're individuals with real, problem, real problems, that's what a real rabbi does. As uh, Shlomo Kalbach once said about the Baal Shem Tov, that Baal Shem Tov liked to be the rabbi of the broken people because everybody likes being the rabbi of the famous and the rich. But the true ones are the ones who don't mind even being the rabbis of the broken and the downtrodden. <clears throat> Number seven, empathy. To empathize with the pain of others. A real rabbi is a real Jew. <laughs> and a real Jew is one who pains the pains of others, not just themselves. The more we do for others, the more it builds us up as individuals. I think I'm at number eight, that they're grieved by the plight of the poor, the neglected and the downtrodden and the forgotten. It bothers them as individuals um, because they could remain on their pedestal and talk to large uh, gatherings of people or talk to the people who like them, who come to listen to them. But in general, they're worried about all. Number nine, they will not give up with any attempt to fix what they can. That they believe that the world can be fixed. It's just a matter of time. It might be, an, you might call them overly optimistic, but it's a real belief that human nature has the ability to solve the problems of the human situation. And um, and number 10, I just want to say that if you haven't found yet met a rabbi like that, keep looking. Because <laughs> it says in Pirkei Avot, every individual has a responsibility to find themselves a rabbi. So you can't say, but the rabbis out there, people are people. You have to find somebody who is going to inspire you. And I've always said the Maharal of Prague says about Aselech Harav, Make for yourself um, a rabbi, like it says in uh, Ethics of the Fathers, chapter one. He says, what does it mean, Nasir al-Kharab, make? How do you make a rabbi? He says, when you find somebody who inspires you to be a better Jew and a better human being, that person should be your rabbi, even if they don't have the title. That's why it says, make for yourself a rabbi. But from the Maharal, we also understand that that's what a rabbi is. It's someone who inspires us, both by the way they live their lives and the way they talk. By the real care for the individual and for the community, for the Jewish people as a whole and for the Jewish people as individuals, for mankind as a whole and as individuals. So, and this, and they are interested in making the world a better place. And they always have time for the simple pure person and not just the wealthy, the powerful, and the celebrities. So these are some things I wanted to say about a rabbi. And uh, since I grew up in the house of a rabbi like that, <laughs> it, makes me, it makes it easier for me to say that. But also when I look at the life, unfortunately short, because he was only 72 when he passed away, but the so inspirational life Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, a blessed memory, we realize that there are individuals like that, and we have to look for them and embrace them, and thank goodness also with the books that he left and the interviews that we can see online, we can still learn from his wisdom, as it says, that his lips will still be teaching us Torah from the world beyond where he, uh, where he is, and uh, will continue to inspire us um, in our lives. Shalom, shalom.